morning, everyone, and welcome to the Indica Books Writers Workshop. Today is the 20th of uh, November, and uh, welcome all. We are here to, to, to get feedback on our writing, to discuss our writing pieces among ourselves, and to get feedback and uh, engage in this discussion with Otis. You can head over to the Indica Books uh, Twitter handle to get more information at uh, twitter.com slash uh, indica books on one word or you can uh, head over to our facebook group uh, facebook.com slash group slash indic book club and uh, we also put up our videos on youtube so just go to the indica handle and uh, indica page site sub site on uh, youtube and you can find our all our playlists going back 65 sessions today i believe is the 66th and with that otis i will turn this over to you Okay, thank you. Um, well, the the uh, the last thing I was going to say about uh, the writer's block is that you know a key. So you know, drawing upon this sort of dopamine nation and the Twitter and the, all these things that become addictive to us, um, that five minute rule basically it entails sitting down and writing for five minutes, and then when you're done with the five minutes. I mean, I, I honestly did this for a while until now I don't have to. You throw your hands up in the air and you say, I did it, you know, <laughs> I achieved my goal, right? And give yourself that positive feedback. You can keep writing or you can stop. I also did it first thing in the day, so it wasn't weighing on me. I had time. I'd just wake up five minutes early if I wanted to do it first thing in the day. And then I felt good all day. Writing was the most important thing for me to do in my life. So I'd accomplish the thing that I wanted to do for that day. The rest of the day was, as they say, gravy. So I was just, I was done. Um, you can keep writing. You, if you think that you're not, it's not enough. The other thing that I find that I have to grapple with continuously is uh, in my own work and with others is perfectionism. And uh, rewriting my novel where I am right now um, is very hard because a lot of it I think is right. And yet I still have to write other things that I'm like, okay, this isn't gonna be right the first time. You know, I'm, I'm doing that sort of fill in thing. I need to write this part. I need to write this part. It's not gonna be right. It's very maddening to feel like there's some parts that I've worked over a lot. They're done as far as I'm concerned, but I still have to go through that process of writing something that is not done. Um, that is a mess even. That's just really, honestly, if I were to print it, it would just be ink on the page, but I still have to do that in order to get to the point where I can work on it and then begin to bring it up to the level where it, it is getting close to completed, if that makes sense. I mean, that, that, that first thing that you write, I am really, at this point, I'm like, that is just all, every single word, every period, every punctuation mark is just a placeholder for some other word at this point. But it's something tangible and concrete to work with. Where we do not want to work, I don't want to overstate this, is in the metaphysical, okay? Let's not overwork the metaphysical realm. Let's work on the physical realm. Five minutes a day, put words on the page. You can look at them. You see that word? Hmm, I'd rather have a different word. Oh, look at that. I wrote an adverb again, which is a signpost for a weak verb. Okay, I'm going to cut that. I'm going to have a stronger verb. And then we can just go ahead that way. Uh, Brochu, let's look at your piece. Uh, let me share if I have that capability. Tell us a little yes. bit about this brunch shoe. So, uh, so basically, I, I remember we had this conversation some some weeks ago regarding the narrator, right? So, I I sort of uh, had written a book, bunch of these stories, oh. uh, like a thousand word uh, stories, uh, uh, as separate, like you know, like small short tales of Mahabharat, and you know, related. Uh, materials so what i did was i i you had talked about like the omniscient narrator or something so i said okay let me make narrator omniscient krishna the the, the god himself like literally so and then what he so basically now literally the he 
Mm. So he is now telling that story. The, 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 uh, so actually, unfortunately, I said you three, and uh, I, I think you picked the third one. So that's why you know towards the end you said like, who is he? Who is the narrator? Oh, so, okay. uh, so but that's a very good feedback because you see, you see somebody opens the book on the third chapter, then they should also realize like who is telling the story rather than well, the first time. Thank you for being understanding. I only saw two pieces, and and Pranshu, one of the pieces was something like eleven pages, and I don't have. Oh no, there were two read. stories. Yeah, they were like yeah, each <laughs> okay. of them were like thousand know. words. I see eleven pages. I said I'm going to read the one that's three pages. So <laughs> I should have split I, that. I, yeah, I should have split that into yeah. Okay. Okay. Next, uh, I, so so just to um. So you you did a little bit of a workaround, Pranshu. I have to say, you're very, very crafty at this. Um, so the discussion that Pranshu and I had about his work was about using the first-person narrator. And so he had a character who was describing his own actions in first person. And the point I was trying to make was that um, when you have a first-person narrator, you basically have two eyes that are involved with the piece. You have the eye that's telling the story, and they're basically in the future, and you have the eye that's in the story physically. So we're back to a discussion of physical and metaphysical a little bit. One of those eyes is basically metaphysical, and one of them is physical. So that was the discussion, and, and what I was trying to say was that you want to have, at least in your imaginative capacity, a separation between these two narrators. Uh, sorry, the character and the narrator. So you have the way I really, I have not seen it discussed this way before, but I don't read a lot of books about writing. I just mainly write and learn from my writing itself. But I call this the character eye and this the narrative eye. And to separate those two. So, um, the and the narrator the narrator eye I, I would suggest to everyone regardless of whether it's an eye or an omniscient narrator who's coming in that's not identified as a person right so just um, someone who's speaking a voice I would suggest to everyone that you keep this eye the narrator um, objective because if they have a lot of subjectivity then we start to wonder about them, who they are. They become personified, basically, because subjectivity is the thing that personifies, I think. Um, we, want this, we want this eye to be objective, and then we want our character to be subjective, just like a human being. So they come in, they, they see things, they do things, and they feel things about them that are subject to their own personality. And that's one of the ways we keep them separate. Um, when we're writing a story in which the character is the protagonist, right? We want the narrator to serve the protagonist. So they help us understand things about the protagonist. They help us understand things about the story, but they do not take over the story. In stories such as essays, often we'll have a narrator who actually is the protagonist. And in that case, the character sometimes assists the narrator as like an object example. That's it. That's common in essay form, but that's not really what you're writing, Pranshu. You're writing narratives. So anyway, that was the discussion that Pranshu and I had. And, um, and the reason I'm saying that this is a bit of a workaround is that you actually are choosing a god to be the first person narrator. So you're making a you're making an omniscient character, the I. And that kind of works around the problem that I was trying to describe for you, which is to separate these two sort of, yeah. to, to leave a storyteller off the page as much as you can, even though that storyteller is an I and a person, try to leave them off the page and try to concentrate on that protagonist. Um, but uh, let's see, um, and let's get into this piece a little bit. Um, Uh, maybe you could read a little bit. Do you see the do you see this yeah. page that I have here? If you could just read this until you get to the I think that this is Sanskrit. No, no, it's Hindi. 
Oh, that's Hindi? Okay. Yeah. So basically, so it starts off with a, he stood alone, solitary, Shikar, the, 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 the hero, he, he rises yeah. up, he stands up and he says he stood alone, solitary, single, lonely, solo, single-handedly. He was Akela, alone, Akela. And this is a play on the Hindi word, Kela means bananas. So, and everyone knows Kelas are loved by a certain bhakt, uh, devotee of Ram. Uh, a monkey was living in the tree where once a wooden bird perched or will perch, who can tell in the timelessness of once upon a time. He was witness to the miracle of the Mahadev and the pusillanimity of the populace and the insanity of the sovereign and the courage of the cow, cow herder. And when Shrika stood for just in the justice alone, the monkey dropped from the nearby tree and stood next to him. He had a gada, mace, the latest in the VIP overveer, and a slight smile on his lips and following words on his tongue. O hamsafar na tera jab koi, tu jo, uh, tu jaha rahunga mein wahi, tu se kabhi na mein ek pal bhi mein juda. So if you stand alone, if you, if you stand for something good, then you know I will be there, and here the I is a different. God. It's a different God comes into the picture here. But like the idea is that you know, uh, if you stand if you stand for good and justice, you will never be alone. The God will always be with there. So that's it. Okay. I will come and stand next to you, and one stands for justice. You are never you never stand alone. Okay, good. Um, well, I think that this uh, this piece is interesting, and so I mean, my my main comments that you've seen, I'm like, who you know, whose story is this? Because yeah. when we have a, when we have an omniscient narrator, they can go anywhere, and so omniscience is, from the human perspective, let's say, uh, a lack of focus, and right. human beings are not really capable of understanding universal, you know, everything everything all at once. We're not capable of understanding that. We actually understand the world in a very focused way. So I think in working on this piece, what you should think of is there's there's a, a term we call limited omniscience. That means that yeah, we, have an, we, we have an omniscient narrator, but they limit themselves. And that limitation <clears throat> is a thing that we call focus. And what I would generally suggest that we do because the human, the human mind, we're not as smart as we think we are, Pranshu. I'm going to tell you. This is what I've discovered after many years. Um, we want to try and focus and limit ourselves as much as we can. And so, right, so Abhinav and I, we often have a conversation about, um, what is it, head jumping? What do, what do we call it? Head hopping. Head hopping, right? Yeah, having multiple points of view and where we're going to do that. So that's multiple points of view is something that an omniscient narrator can do. And it's something that we as writers can do anytime we want. We are basically able to be omniscient. But as writers, what we do is we limit ourselves. In our limited, in our, when we limit ourselves, we also define what we're treating. That's a focus that serves the reader. The most important thing that we can do is be is write something that is clearly intelligible to the reader. That's number one. Uh, the thing is with writing today, we are we're battling movies and videos and you know tweets that are you know a few words long and all of these other things. The thing that that, that movies have that we can lack is clarity. All they have to do is get that camera and focus it. And they have a frame and they have a clear picture. That is a tremendous advantage over us. We can put words on the page where we have no frame and no clear picture, right? And there's no way that our frameless, obscure image is going to compete with a picture in a, you know, with a, my kids with a TikTok. We cannot compete with TikTok unless we're clear. So I would strongly encourage all of us, okay, and I'm going to say now more than ever, okay, in the, at the time of Tolstoy, he did not have the kind of competition that we have today when he was writing War and Peace. So he has a lot of characters, and he goes into all of their points of view, and basically Tolstoy thought he was an omniscient god, 
who could understand all of the universe. And maybe he could. I don't want to take that away from him. In his time, maybe he could. But today we say no. So I would I would try and get, if you're going to stay with Krishna, that makes it a little bit complicated because obviously Krishna has personality. But you could have it be him. And then he should limit himself just to this main character that you have. Sorry, I've lost his name here. Yeah, Shrikar. No, that's another thing I was thinking. Maybe instead of the title of the story had Shrikar in it, maybe will that have helped a little bit from the beginning well, for that, the that, reader? That'll help a little bit, but with, but you need your sentences to focus. This is this is the relationship of having a, a narrator basically concentrate their attention on a point of view character. Make Shika your point of view character and have everything in the story seen from their point of view. Even though you have an omniscient narrator, they're limiting themselves. We always have an omniscient narrator. They limit themselves in various degrees. Limit your omniscient narrator to just this one character and their point of view. So you do not have, don't write sentences. I mean, I'm just trying to give us the tools so that we can compete. Don't write sentences in which something is seen that they can't see or something is heard that they can't hear physically. We're talking about physicality locate your it's like locating your movie camera except for your movie camera has sight uh hearing smell taste touch they have all the sensory perceptions not just one so that's valuable you make that character your camera and have everything in this movie take place from them so they become central and they're always centralized by every single sentence and we are, as the reader, we're then with them. We're like inside that character moving along through the story. I would just suggest that because I yeah, think we have to be. Yeah, because for all of like, us, hmm. Oh, I was just going to say, we have to be realists because yeah. we're not just writing. We're not just writing because we want to write. That's fine. If you want to write because we want to write, but you wouldn't be here if that's the reason, because you wouldn't tolerate my abuse. Right. Um, we're writing yeah, because we want to be read. And because we want to be read, it means that we're competing not only with every TikTok and every movie and every book that's ever been written. We're competing with all of those things. We're also competing with life. So because we're competing with everything else for our reader's attention, for a human being's attention, we have to do something that is both um, very satisfying safe and locating for that reader, but also relevant for that reader. Two things. And so in this case, we're talking primarily about creating that focus. And then the other very big piece of it is to create a journey of relevance. Those two things. And then we're really, you know, we'll capture, we can't control who opens our book. But like I, I've said many times, once they do open the book, we do not let them go. We do not let them close that book. Uh, Prancho, I interrupted you, so. What no, 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 that was just saying, that's the thing, you know, I said, for example, the line about like, no one protested or stopped the armies. So I could have like, instead of that saying a shikhar was aghast that no one stopped or protested at the, arm, uh, at, at, at the armies marching into the city. And he was like, so basically, you know, then then the focus is on, so then we are hearing all the remaining things, including, you know, the king's madness and everything through Shikar's viewpoint. And that will focus it, right? That that will, uh, uh, and that's when Shikar takes a decision that I will stand and I will fight alone if nobody will fight with me. And so right. that's how I can change the narrative here, right? Right. Well, just try and make, Try and make the everything that is being experienced in this in the sentences, the sentences you're writing, make them physical things that your point of view character can perceive physically, right? And they can have reactions to those things emotionally. And I'm going to say that emotions are also physical because we exactly. you know that's, neurologically that's, that they are, right? So that's yeah. our sort of interface with the world around us. We see we see a tiger, we get scared. That emotion is a real thing. It's adrenaline in our blood, et cetera, et cetera. But just try and have the it's it's hard because you have quotes here in Hindi, but how does the how does how does your point of view character hear those quotes? 
Um, and he he could be the one who will be saying those quotes to try to and that's something that if we if we if I start the narration again and uh, and actually make it from his point of view that he is aghast at that he tries to rally the people he tries to talk to the king and then he takes the decision to stand then it basically becomes all through Shikhar's point of view and then the and words the, those quotes becomes his his statements or uh, his uh, right. his quotes. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, and I'm going to just say that that is so exciting for uh, the reader, you know, to be placed in that point of view. This is basically the primary thing that we're trying to do. This is our, our point of view character is that little ship, right? And we put the reader inside that ship so that they can experience this world through that character. And that is a very exciting thing. This is now we're competing. And I think that we're when we do that, we do compete against the movies, against the TikToks and all of those things, because this is a very intense and engaged imaginative experience. So one that it's like a it's like a video game, you know, where you're going through it. But there's something larger to it, too, because, like I say, you want to one, put them into that focus point of view. So you're creating a verisimilitude of life itself. I'm experiencing through this character, just like I experienced in my own life, except for everything I'm experiencing is exciting and relevant and three, leading someplace that's going to be important for me and change my life. Great. Yeah, but it's a it's a good start and working through these issues. And once you get this, once you once you figure out how to locate, you already have the stories, Franchu. You have the stories. Your your step is to force yourself to see the story through your point of view character. And if you if you take that step, you're going to be writing these stories that are going to be very, very engaging. Um, so uh, thank thank you for this. Thank you. Um, let's uh, Arun, you're you're here. Let's uh, take a look yeah. at your piece a little bit. Sure. Um, is it one? Is it called? Yeah, that's the one. B. That's the one. I haven't named it yet. So, okay, Arun, put your name. Put your name on these pieces so that I know how to uh, fire will. them back to you. But yeah. Is this your? This is. What? Is this your? Yeah. Go ahead, uh, Albanan. Uh, one more thing, Arun. So when you uh, send it, uh, send it uh, in. Send it double spaced. Yes, I will do that. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Arun, this is your first time uh, jumping into these sessions, yes. I think. Yes, that's right. Uh, I mean, yeah, Abhinav well, has been telling me for a long time, but uh, you know, I, I then heard a couple of your sessions on on YouTube, and I figured, you know, I should. So here I am. Yeah, just no one listens to me. No one I listen to you to all me. the time. <laughs> you hear me. You don't listen to me. You hear me. You you, you don't listen to me. We don't Perfect. have any choice but to hear, Abhinav. This is the thing. We don't have yeah. a choice. It's compulsion um, in one, it's choice in the other. I think I think it's actually, for us as writers, so we have five sensory perceptions. Think about those. I, I think about them very much, and I use them consciously when I write about characters. Um, I'm going to start here, but sight is the most objective. Right, we can decide what we see and what we don't see. Hearing, for me, is next because we cannot choose what we hear and we don't hear, but we can choose whether we understand it or not. Right? Um, let me think. Smell is the next because that's something though you can't see it actually coming into your body. Right? I mean, those other things are too, of course, but even we're just moving a little bit more. So now sound waves. Now we add, actually have something that we're smelling, taste. Um, actually, I would put touch probably here. Touch is a little bit more tactile. Then we have smell. And then the most intimate of our senses, taste, right? So I actually use those to, when I'm working in point of view, we sometimes want to depict the exterior environment. And we do that objectively. And I do that generally with sight. But as we want to become more subjective, we go through hearing, touch, smell, and taste to, to gain greater and greater interiority, as we call it, 
And uh, I sometimes think about it like an onion. So we mm -hmm. can, in point of view, we can look at the outside world, but then we can enter the inside world through this sensory information and then get to the most subjective, which are thoughts, Yeah. right? They're not even, thoughts are, not, are basically even disconnected. You know, they might be triggered from the outside environment and they should be, but they're disconnected from that outside environment and then come back out. So you can go through like an onion into and out of your characters through writings. Um, Arun, I uh, appreciated what you wrote in your email of being intrigued about this idea of point of view and you clearly took on that task in this piece. Um, so can you read, um, let me get a little marker for you. I'm just, I'm actually going to put it here. So just stop at, stop at the pink, maybe just read the beginning okay. and then, and then stop there. Um, so, so you want me to read, start from the beginning and then stop at the, uh, where the marker at the stops? Pink. Yes, please. Okay. At, at, the, at the marker, just at the beginning of the marker. Sorry, I, it's okay. not easy. For the yeah, okay, I'll do that. The older man bent over as he tried to gulp air into his starving lungs. He was immensely powerful, but, um, and I noticed you put old, yeah, old age does have a way of neutralizing that. His lungs gasped for life-giving air as he stood in one corner of the sand pit. His opponent, a much younger but equally well-muzzled man, stood on the far side, seemingly none the worse for wear. And I agree, I should show it. Uh, so that was a great catch. The older man looked around. At the dozens of broken maces strewn outside the pit. They were his maces. He'd never had that happen to him before. In all the wars and bouts that he had ever fought, it had never once happened that his maze had shattered. But they had here, repeatedly. He looked at his adversary, who, following the rules of dharma, had now flung aside his own mace so that the fight could again be against equals, similarly armed. Or in this case, unarmed. He shifted his gaze to his adversary's mace, the mace that had shattered so many of his own, the mace that now lay carelessly on the floor outside the pit. The, the mace had given a deep gong when it had struck the floor. He noticed the blackness of his opponent's mace and his eyes flicked to pieces of his own maces that were a brilliant burnished bronze. What on earth is that, he thought. I've never seen that before and I've never been hit that hard before. I'll stop there. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, iron. <laughs> nice. Um, you know, uh, can you go ahead and read these last two paragraphs too? Let's, let's have those also. So the older man looked at the two men standing outside the ring. Okay. The older man looked around at the two men standing outside the ring and noticed the peacock feathered man take a twig from the ground and split it in two. Immediately, he felt excruciating pain as he realized what his opponent was doing. The younger man was easing his left foot back towards his torso in an attempt to literally tear his muscles even as his other foot clamped down on his right foot. The older man's eyes teared up because of the pain as he felt his groin muscles tear. An involuntary scream left his throat and reverberated around the hall. Strangely, the scream seemed to continue forever, and even as the older man kept screaming without understanding that it was his own scream, there are too many screams there. I'll, I should need to read. Yeah, yeah, it. no worries. Yeah, no worries. sorry. Uh, I, I like I said, it was a you know this is my raw draft that I've sent you. Um, <laughs> that he continued me, every to hear. Draft is, Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> Blood flowed from his nether regions as he was torn into two pieces by the young giant. As the life force ebbed away from him, Jarasandha's last thought incongruously enough, was about his opponent's mace. What was, his, what was it made of that it could shatter all my maces? Right. Um, yeah, so, so Arun, I think we... I wanted, when, we, when I started talking, I was talking about, like, try to recognize that there's, there's big things that we want to do, and then there's little things that are absolutely meaningless. So we just have to accept them. Like, you know, having too many screams, these are these are editing things. You know, yeah. I don't even care about those until I get to a 10th revision. I mean, it, it's not it's not material. Um, 
And, and this too, like the well-muscled man stood on the far side, seemingly none the worse for wear. There's so many times, this is what I mean about putting in words that are placeholders. Okay, those uh, seemingly none the worse for wear is a placeholder that you've recognized imaginatively that you do want to show it, but in a sense, right at the moment, you want to get on with the story. So mm -hmm. you just put that there. And when you come back to it, you're like, he stood on the other side. He hopped on his feet. He looked over to the side of the ring and back at, you know, yeah. the main character. So, yeah. so hopped on his feet does that act of showing. It's not a big deal. When you have time in the second, a third, a fourth draft, we want to get good. All of us as writers, we want to get good at spotting when we're just telling things, when we're basically uh, taking a shortcut. That's all we're doing. We're taking a shortcut because we don't want to imagine. Uh, that is a muscle that we build. And it's one that we, you know, I mean, I, I would like to say that I don't write things that, uh, you know, I, I, I don't um, tell rather than show now, but I still do it. It's just a muscle that we build. Um, yeah. The more we work on it, however, for all of us in our drafts, as we keep redrafting, as we try to avoid going to telling and not showing, the more we actually build that muscle of, of the imagination. And that mm -hmm. is a very good tool for us because it really, because not only does it put the reader in the scene, when we do it, right, we do it first, it puts us in the scene. Yes. And then we start to really inhabit our character. And when we start to really inhabit our character, then we also really start to know our character. Yeah. And when, and not to be too, when we know our character, then we can actually put that character on the page. And that's yeah. not, and now we're not putting us on the page, ideally. We're putting that character on the page. And characters are the things that we work with. We are dramatists. And we work with characters. Characters are our tools. So we have mm -hmm. to get to the point where we understand them. But I think you've done a really great job of putting yourself into this character. Uh, he's in this, he's in this physical confrontation with this other, with this opponent. The opponent has a tool that he's using that is filling the older man with doubt <laughs> about his success. And that doubt is going to be his undoing. Um, I think that that's I think that that's really great. Um, so this is, you know, drawing from what I was saying to Pranshu, this is this is the outcome that we can get when we focus and limit ourselves to a point of view. You have yeah. limited yourself to this character's point of view. And that's what makes this writing so engaging. You, you wrote to me in the email that you were intrigued by this idea that we can, you know, create in a character basically uh, a situation of peril, but that's also safe for the reader so that they can experience that. Yeah. Right. And so in this well, case, well I, I, I heard you say that. So I was just right. Yeah, right. recounting what I heard you say in another another video. So, well, you you <laughs> well. Wonderfully, you you heard me say it, and you and you incorporated it into your work, and that's basically what's able to happen here. I, as the reader, and anyone as a reader, is able to go through this experience as this old man in this situation that none of us would sign up for. I am going to tell you, none of us want to be part of this, but we're able to do it, and we're able to glean a kind of lesson about humanity and ourselves through the experience, even though it's an experience that none of us would ever want to have. So I think you're accomplishing that. Okay, thank you. The, the, next, um, the next element, you know, as I said to Pranchu, there's two things that we want to do. We want to create that, um, that capsule in point of view that we take the reader through the experience with, right? And we want to make sure that the character is actually experiencing things that seem legitimate and human, because otherwise that reader will not feel like they're joined with them. They will kind of um, disassociate. Like in this case, I read with interest 
but did I feel did I feel the reality fully? You did a great job in sticking with that character. Did I feel the reality fully? So, so. What um, could I have done better? What, what is it that would have <clears throat> made you feel that reality? Well, the, the imaginative process is probably, so I, I boxed and, um, <clears throat> You know, there's 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 a lot to deal with when you're dealing with pain. <laughs> you know, there's a lot to deal with. Uh, uh, pain pain is the great dissuader of our of our best intentions. So there's some aspects of the physicality, you know, and that's an imaginative process because so I boxed, but I have not been hit by an iron mace, mm -hmm. right? So I have to try and translate from my experiences and you have to translate from your experiences, whatever your experiences are of that. You know, yeah. this is this is the next step we do as writers. We basically we understand, right? We're we're creating this this human being, we're putting another human being in it, right? How do we understand this human being we're putting on the page? Because we understand ourselves. It's through self-understanding and then the amplification, the dramatic amplification of what we understand about ourselves that we then put into the character as best we can. We're going to have limitations. We have to accept our limitations, but we also have to push so, against them. So what is one, one of the things? So I, uh, this story, by the way, is a very, very well-known story that probably every Indian child knows. In the sense, this particular fight, it comes in the Mahabharata and it's part of that. And so I had actually got my, uh, my elder daughter to read it. And she came out of the room after she read it and she said, when in that paragraph uh, that starts, which said, he noticed the dark, handsome man standing outside with his arms folded across his chest, a peacock feather tucked into his hair. She said... Yeah. I read that and it suddenly like I felt like an explosion because till that time it was just somebody fighting. Everybody knows in India that there's only one character in India who has a peacock feather tucked in his hair and that's Krishna. And so when when she read it, that, oh, I didn't know that. that gave her that, oh, that's what it is type of. So okay. uh, I think. Yes. <clears throat> So, so you're you're hitting upon a, a good moment. So that's a we, we'll just think about it. I, I would say you you'll forgive me. I'll make the argument that it isn't because it's a cue and a, a you know a kind of a symbol that denotes Krishna, which is nice. I mean, this is it's nice to be able to have a character that's differentiated from the crowd with some kind of detail. But detail is basically what I'm talking about. We use, as writers, we use detail to draw our reader into a myopic focus on the text. So that's a little bit, so that pain, right? So how do you, you know, it could be the pain, you know, some details of it. He looked at his, his knuckles that were, that were bruised and purple from bludgeoning his opponent, you know, whatever it yeah. is, you know, yeah. but, or and it could be like, um, <clears throat> In a way, you actually have his his fixation on what the mace is made out of. That's a detail that draws us into this piece. But it also mm -hmm. could be a, it could be a pebble that's in his shoe, or you know, um, as he as he took the blow, he noticed that his shoelace was untied. He might trip yeah. over that, and he was hit again. Right. So there's yeah. you know, details create you know the human being. The way our brains work, basically, we have uh, the capacity to look at large things. But when we feel threatened, we we have that reptilian brain, or you know, however you want to describe it. Right. We we end up having this focused survival brain that sees things very clearly. This is part of what we want to do. We want to mm -hmm. use that. We actually use this sort of effect of like creating uh, these dramatic circumstances, conflicts. And they don't have to just be physical conflicts. They can be emotional conflicts. 
they draw us into a kind of focus with that survival brain. And then we also open up into summary or more abstract thinking. So we actually take the reader through these uh, periods of tension, and then we bring them up to periods of release from that tension, and then tension again, and then release. And this is how we draw the reader along. I sometimes, I don't know if you know Aikido, there are many martial arts that are like this, but in Aikido, you, yeah. you, you go to punch the Aikido master and the Aikido master goes, oh, take you this way. Yeah. And then when you start to resist going that way, what do they do? They take you this way. And then when you start to resist going that way, they take you this way again. And then back this way, and then they flip you on your back. That's a physical representation of what we do to the reader also emotionally. We make them tense until they, they, they want to resist that tension. And then we bring them up to something abstract summary. So we have what I call tension and release, tension I think, and release. I think it, it, it works in music also, right? Where you, you go for tension and then you release it at the end, coming back to the tonic maybe when you're, when you're playing something. Um, it, is absolutely, it is absolutely the same as music. Music is the first language, right? I mean, yeah. the bird song is the first language. So, or there's songs before that even. There, the water on the brook is a language. So, yes, absolutely. Um, it is like music. It is like so much in life. Um, and it, it's like our lives too, right? We, yeah. we become tense and we need to hunt and gather. And then we eat and we're satiated and relaxed. And then we need to hunt and gather again. So it's it's very much in keeping with the with the human being that we are. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that's a very nice point about the peacock feather, which I also noticed too. When when we get those details, particularly those ones that are visual, but then we we have that sort of those visual details that make the movie start going off in our head. But like I say, we can also use that other sensory information, um, hearing, touch, taste, smell, and we should because they also connect us with the character experience. They put us into that character. So yeah. both those visual experiences in detail and also those specific interior experiences. He smelled, so I... as, as, as the mace came towards him, he smelled a whiff of jasmine saw mm. a woman in the crowd pouring tea the mm. mace struck him he fell to the ground you know yeah i get it yeah i get it Rob? yeah uh sorry to be a little bit of a buskill here but i'm just wondering if uh, while doing a mace fight the fighter will notice things like this on the periphery of the audience okay so let me let me address Okay, our purpose is to write <laughs> well. So my purpose is to write well. I would not say, so I, like, let's say that example, the mace came towards him, he smelled jasmine. Okay, it's not that he notices he smelled jasmine. If there's jasmine in the air, he smells it. Right. It's not that he cognizantly understands that that's the case. It's not that he has even cognizant control over his eye focus to look over and see a woman pouring tea. Right. But I don't have to answer all those questions. What I have to do is I have to put the reader into, into that it. character yeah. so that, that when that character gets hit, the reader feels so, it. I think you have to put the character into the scene is what I'm hearing you say, Otis, right? To, yeah. to feel as if he or she is literally inside that sand pit along with the main character that you're talking about. Right, right. So our this is, you know, I sometimes say this about um, writing stereotypes or cliches. Okay, so when I used to, when when I was teaching the workshops, you know, I would say, you know, you're you're this person's a stereotype, and I would always get some, you know, some student that knew everything, you know, they'd be like, but stereotypes really exist. It's like, actually, no, they don't. Nobody on earth is a stereotype to themselves. They're living their own life. Stereotypes yeah. are something that you put onto someone else. So that's yeah. number one. But secondly, even if they did exist. 
It would be hackneyed writing that's already been done. That makes it bad writing and not engaging. And we can never write badly. So even if you were to argue that these people, that a stereotype really exists, you cannot write it because it's bad. It's like, mm -hmm. it is not engaging writing. The, the thing that makes writing good is that it engages us. We do the things that engage the reader. That is our job. So, I mean, look at the heightened drama that all of our, you know, I mean, movies are doing it all the time, but also stories are, right? You know, we could be writing life, and here I go, I woke up in the morning, I, you know, I brushed my teeth, you know, we, you know, all of that boring stuff of, right, of life, we could say, oh, well, I'm writing a story of life, no one's going to read it. We're clearly being selective. We're clearly, we're clearly picking what, picking and choosing in order to engage that reader, which is our number one task. Um, if we don't do that, we don't have that reader. And I think so, in this, when you said smells jasmine, I think when a reader reads that, his memory, the brain reacts differently when, because he's remembering the smell of jasmine actually. You know, you can do that. If you if you think of a smell, you can actually trigger your memory to smell it. And yes. that is very powerful in that sense. Well, it's also basically I'm also I mean, I'm not consciously doing this, but now if I'm analyzing it, I'm creating the effect of calmness. Right. So, you know, the mace rose, he smells jasmine, which might say ah tea and being relaxed, da 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 da. And the crushing blow Boom, came yeah. down upon him, right? So I'm creating a contrast between those two images, and that accentuates the action. We don't, we're we're writing, you know. Am I going to be able to reproduce the um the emotional <laughs> and physical blow of a mace? No, I can't. I use language to do it. So how do I use language to do it? Right? How do I how do I depict the um, the body? You know, and I know this pretty well because I've been concussed a number of times. How do I depict the body not being hit and then being hit? Right? So I'm mm. using this idea of the tea and the jasmine to basically give you a sense of ah ah look at me I'm fine right now. It's like I'm like drinking tea and now I'm like getting hit with a mace. Mm. You, this is how we understand the world. So it's, um, and I also, <laughs> I know a little bit from experience, it is possible to have that lack of focus, you know, in the moment. And then I'm going to tell you truthfully afterwards, you're like, oh my God, I wish that person was not drinking tea outside of the ring and I didn't look at them and instead I ducked. So, you know, um, okay. so the next one, Arun, so you're doing a great job with this. Yes, you can heighten these effects of being in this character. But the next thing to be thinking about is the other thing I was saying to Pranchu is it's not enough simply to put the character. This is definitely a step we need to get to where we can put the reader into the character that we're drawing through the story. But then we have the next issue that we actually take them through a story experience that ends up being relevant to their experience. Because we are asking a reader to walk out of their lives and to go into this life. But we should never think that the reader's life is not absolutely of number one importance to them. It is. It is more important. The reader's life is more important to them than the life of this king who is about to be defeated. Mm -hmm. It's just our nature, I believe. So we need to make sure that we create a story that gives the reader something of relevance. I say pretty often that the purpose of story is to take this protagonist and change them. The reader going along with that character should also be changed. They should see the world differently than they saw it at the beginning of the story. And when they see the world differently, that means that they learn something. They've taken away something of relevance that's important for their own survival and their own life. 
And so that's the next stage. Okay. Um, I think you did a great job where this piece is ending. You know, I think you do a great job of depicting this character. But I'm going to say that's not enough. We use the character as a vehicle for the reader's experience in which they also receive something. And that's okay. when we when we do both of those things together, then we're actually fusing these two, the reader and the character, we're fusing them into one and drawing them through an experience of life that leaves both of them changed. Can, can I and ask that, you a question here? Yeah. So in this so this is this is the prologue to the story. The character actually who appears in the prologue is not germane to the rest of the story. In a sense, the character that is important in this prologue is actually the iron, the metal iron. <laughs> okay, so that's the important bit in this story. And that's what I wanted to highlight. Through the sequence of events that happened a thousand years before the story is actually set. I wanted to bring that piece out of it. Hmm. This, um, <clears throat> well, would your I, would your comments remain? Would you would your would your uh, comments remain the same if you know that, or it's immaterial? You still want the character to. Right, right, you still right, I, not feeling it. Okay, so I think I understand. This is I don't we, we probably can't take up too much time with this, but so yeah. if I read this as a prologue, I would understand probably from the title, you know, ideally what the focus of the book is going to be. So if mm -hmm. the focus of the book is actually going to be the iron, so then I would understand that this was a story that highlighted iron, not one that highlighted character, even though I was in character point of view. So yeah. I would understand a larger context and mm -hmm. I would I would probably accept, yeah, I think I would accept this prologue as it is. Um, I mean, I would still want you to have more detail and a little sure. bit more realism in it so that I can experience it more so. But I think, um, and then, yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's possible that, you know, that that iron becomes sort of the last thought of this king, this defeated king. Um, but you have some other problems that you should think about because if you make iron the focus that's very different than making character the focus the reason that i as a as a human being can identify and move along with your character of this king uh, is not just because i'm an old man but it's because you know we're we're human beings right so mm -hmm. basically my my proposition is that we can get any human being from anywhere on earth to basically you know, fuse with our point of view character who mm -hmm. is struggling with life because the struggle of life is a universal condition for us all. So, but when you have iron, iron is, from my point of view, inanimate, or at least as yeah. I perceive it. So it's much harder for me to kind of go along for the ride of iron. But there's been, that I know of, and maybe others, you know, there's a book, The History of Salt, right? That that tells a story of world history by focusing on the thread of salt throughout that history. I actually haven't read that book, but I appreciate the design of it. It's a history book, right? That uses salt as its thread, you know, sort of tell, you know, telling that that prolonged story of its development and refinement or or what have you to draw us through this sort of complex history of the world. Um, I don't know if that's what you intend, but... but that's... No, no, this is, it's a fiction, but it's just that iron plays a role in the story. Uh, it's not, it plays ro a, a critical role in terms of why certain things happen. Uh, the story happens, yeah, but iron is like a prime mover. Uh, at okay. times it comes in, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, let's let's see if you uh, no, I will. If yeah, if you're if you're moving from different different characters, though, because obviously this king comes in the prologue and he's dead at the end of it. Yeah. So yeah. then the question is, who are we going to be involved with next and what are they going to be doing? Yeah. So it, it has to like in this case, you have a conflict. It's actually a physical conflict clearly creates this sense of what's going to happen. So all of those things are are the case. 
but normally we can't have fighting throughout the entire piece because that's yeah. going to be, you know, that ends up actually being a flat line in terms of our experience. But you still want to have a sense of conflict. You still want to draw us into a character. And we need to care about that character and that character's experience. We also still need to go on a journey that brings us someplace that we um, brings us to a place where we see the world in a new way. Yeah. So those are still uh, challenges. But I personally do not worry about all the challenges. I try to loosely, I think of uh, writing as being like a lucid dream. You know, if you're having a lucid dream, you can kind of direct what's happening a little bit, but not really. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. oh my God, what's going on here? You know, so sure. that's what our writing is a little bit. We try to direct it a little bit. We're like, oh, we have these responsibilities. We have this kind of overview. But our main responsibility is to dig in and have the imaginative experience. So yeah. you've already shown that you can do that. So keep doing it. And then understand some of the difficulties that occur when we do things that are not like our lives. I'm going to live and die within one point of view, mine. That's the benefit of a single point of view throughout a story. So if you're going to be moving through different points of view, you're doing something that's unusual for me, but it gives you some responsibilities that you'll have to take on. You'll have to draw us into each new point of view character as thoroughly as you did this king. Okay. And those characters will all have to be different. Yeah. Like, you know, uh, the different and the, and different and the same, right? They're different. Sure personally in terms of their own subjective bias in their life but they're the same in terms of the life struggle that that is true for us all sure. but so no, but great story. thank you so much i i know we've taken a lot of time uh, but thank you and i'll i'll keep i'll be regular i'll be i'll be hounding you with a few pieces every week or maybe a, a piece at least a week do do whatever feels right we don't want to burden ourselves as writers so but uh, i look forward to seeing more thank you yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, I want to say. Um, Nivedita. Hi, how are you? Yes. Hi, hi. I'm good. Thank you. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. You you've been to these sessions before, I think. Yes, this is my third. Oh, great, session. great. Well, thanks for submitting something. Um, so, Nivedita, uh, uh, tell us a little bit about this piece. Where did you go? Where have you disappeared to? Um. um so I um yeah, I have a couple of questions. So, but I think I will just tell you what uh, speak about what I was, what I wanted to do. Uh, was I was I wanted to have provide I wanted to give a sarcastic take on a very serious topic. Yeah. Right. So yeah, okay. and um, I got that. Oh, fantastic! Thank you. <laughs> you made my day. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is it is great to know that when our intention is received, that is a good, very, very good thing for us to know as writers. Yeah. Um, I was just a little confused about the format in which to present it. Um, you know, uh, this topic. Um, so from that perspective, that and um, I was also actually very confused about when to do the reveal about what it is, what caused it, you know, the whole thing. Um, so, um, yeah, yeah, that's... So, <laughs> the things like I mean, it also reveal... comes... Yeah, I mean, yeah. it also comes from a very personal place. This is actually by far my most uh, uh, personal piece. It uh, intertwines a lot of my... You know, um, and it's, it's just, yeah, that's, it's very personal. That's all I can say. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, well, let's, um, let's see, let's, uh... 
Hmm. Okay, let me see if I can do that. Okay, so can you read this part? If you want to help an RC woman and then get down to her old self soon, can you just read that short part? Yeah, sure. Um, if you want to help a RC woman, approach her slowly and calmly. In our experience, RCW do not attack unless attacked first. Explain that you are going to take her to bed. It helps if she likes you. On Thursday, the video of a man with severe burns on his face went viral. His wife was cooking when she got hit by RC. She fell forward on the stove, spilling hot food all over her. Her husband, hearing the commotion, entered the kitchen and tried to pull her away. She upturned another boiling vessel of food on his head. While we have, se while we have all seen the video of the man screaming in pain, his wife suffered burn injuries too. Secondly, if there are children around, explain to them that the woman needs some rest and will be up and her old self soon. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, um, this, uh, this piece, um, Nivedita, did we lose you? No, no, I'm here, I'm here. Oh, okay. Please continue. Okay. Yeah, good. Thank you. Otherwise, I feel like I'm just talking into the void. <laughs> I, believe Sorry. me, I do I do plenty of that. Plenty. Um, yeah. The uh, so this piece is, um, you know, for for writing, I'm going to class it as a little experimental because you have a couple different mediums that you're sort of mixing here. In the beginning, you have this, uh, this introductory paragraph, the past five days have been tumultuous for our country and our women in particular. Amidst the climate, you know, it sounds to me like that newscaster voice, you know, it's that stereotype yeah. kind of, the past five days have been tumultuous in our country and our women in particular, amidst the climate, you know, it's like that, da, 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 da. I, I could play this part, right? Um, yeah. But in writing, right, on TV, I have this person with the microphone, right? So I have on TV, this is going back to like the metaphysical and the physical a little bit. On TV, there's a physical person who's talking. But when I'm reading it, I don't have any sense of that. So it's only just a voice in my head, basically, that I'm reading. Hmm. It is difficult, I would say, for the reader the reader's not grounded in something that's just a voice, right? So it's like, yeah. remember we we're talking about sort of point of view. There's yeah. always a point. There's always a point of view in every story, but the question is, what is it? I was suggesting to some writers before that they limit themselves to a point of view of a single character, right? They take their narrator who's writing words and they see the world from a character who looks outward, right? In this right. case, there's still a point of view, but I don't know what it is. I don't know whether it's me seeing a TV screen, because the only sensory perception I get is basically a non-physical, right? It's, it's a non-physical perception. It's simply yeah. hearing. It's reading words. For me, it's essentially abstract. So this, like, Anytime we write things that are just abstractions, they mm -hmm. don't have that physicality that grounds me someplace and makes me feel like I'm in a narrative. So <laughs> what I'm basically counseling people to do, right, is to write yeah. something that is a narrative because a narrative is an extremely powerful way to get a reader involved in an experience. I mean, at the end of the day, what, what we want as writers is we need to make a compromise of both getting our reader and conveying something that we think is important. You know, and, and then and then we, we we need to get that reader, we need to make that experience relevant for them, and we need to be we need it to be we want it to be important for us, right? We're trying to communicate yeah. with our reader, but we have to mm -hmm. compromise ourselves so much to do so. We can't just go. Hey, listen, let me tell you the truth about something, right? We have to yeah. do this stuff for the reader. If we yeah. if if we're not involving the reader in a narrative, in a clear yeah. narrative in which they're sort of physically located, which I'm saying is a very, very powerful tool, 
then we're basically doing something that's experimental. Yeah. yeah. From what from what I'm teaching, it's not to say yeah. that it's not good. There there's definitely um, this piece. I find this piece engaging and experimental. But do I feel like I was involved in an experience? Yeah. I was involved in a meta experience. I mean, I was involved in a metaphysical experience. For me, that's not as powerful right. as a as a as that physical experience of going through, let's say, that old king as he's getting the tar knocked out of him, right? Um, yeah. It's not to say you can't do it. But I think where where we start to well, I'm going to say two things. One, if we want to do something that's experimental, we should be aware of the problems of it and try and meet those problems somehow. And so the meta aspect of this piece is a problem. So how do you get the reader involved in it physically is a question we might ask. I had a teacher, I've talked about this teacher many times, Bill Harrison, when I was at doing my MFA at the University of Arkansas. He's the teacher that said, <laughs> I always give this preamble, he's the teacher that said, I would have rather cut off both my hands at the wrist than write this paragraph. So I was very glad that was not my paragraph at the time, but it easily could have been. His, he was very scathing. Um, but he said this, he said, if you're going to, he said this about experimental writing. Hmm. He said, if you're going to invite everyone to a cricket match, I'm using hmm. cricket. He said football. He's from Texas. If you're going to invite everyone to a cricket match and you walk out into the middle of the pitch and you start juggling, you better be a hell of a juggler. Hmm. You, you see the, you invite every you invite yeah. everyone to the cricket match and you okay. juggle, you better be a hell of a juggler. So in a in a sense, I'm saying, you know, when we invite someone into a story, they expect a story, a mm -hmm. narrative. And if they don't get that, we better do something that's really extraordinary, you know. Yeah. And and this is good. I mean, I, I am really getting a lot of what you're after here. I hear that sense of voice. I, I hear that sort of newscaster, but then I become confused when we go into this other thing. So like, that's a newscaster I can accept, but then I'm not sure how to interpret this next kind of format, which is an interview. So see how I become confused. I don't know, I, I'm not sure what I'm dealing with. The reader is always trying to figure things out. And they're basically trying to th figure things out in some kind of physical way, because mm -hmm. that's the world as they understand it. So they're trying to gain some ground, and it's difficult for me to put these things together. Yeah. Um, then, then you have this third. Then you have Anisha's stomach grumbles. It's nearly four p.m. and she skipped lunch, and she's in a newspaper office. So now I'm. You know, again, I'm struggling to figure out what's going on. Was she in a newsroom first? Was that her first paragraph? Is this a news article? Is this an interview? When did the interview happen? Is it happening now? Did it happen before? I have a lot of questions. That's that's hard. You notice that at the at the at the bottom, I said, you know, I mean, I, I understood the satire. Um, hmm. I said I could see the film version of this piece, and I'm seeing I'm saying that a little bit because I don't really know how to say what to do with this piece as it's written right now. But I can see how if you if you were a director of a film, how you would do it, right? Nivedita, can you see? Like, I mean, I think you have a kind of cinematic kind of scope. If you had that TV reporter. If you had uh, some of these women who were kind of going comatose and then striking back at their husbands, you know, if, if we, if you treated it sort of like a, like one of those movies, 
you know, like the contagion movies that we get, yeah. you know, like, you know, some kind of virus. It's like, what's going on? What's happening? Right. And, yeah. and it was a satire, you know, it's a satire movie of those contagion, it's taking those contagion movies, but the, mm. but the virus is just, you know, this social construct of these women being completely uh, overworked and subserviated, right? That's the, that's the virus that the, that, that everyone is experiencing. And I think that that's, that could make a, you know, a wonderful satire as a movie, but you see what the movie does, like I was saying earlier, the movie always concretizes our experience because they show us yeah. pictures of things. Mm. Words do not necessarily have to show us pictures of things, but movies do. So if we have words that do not show us any pictures of things, do not have these sensory perceptions, then we lack physicality. And yeah. lacking physicality, the reader is up in, you know, they're just floating around in the universe. And that's not a very comfortable experience for the reader. Yeah. Um, um, so my, my, my question was, in fact, after I received your feedback, that first paragraph about her sitting in the newspaper office, I moved it to the beginning. Right. So, so there's that's that would be one way to do it. And then, okay. uh, so you know, like you can create a physicality within this woman who's just simply writing it. You know, she sat down at her typewriter and began to type on the computer. And then right. next paragraph, right? And you set it aside. The past five days have been, so now we understand it's her voice and she's okay. typing it right now. Yeah, right. That becomes the focus of the story. Will it be good or not? I can't say because all you have basically as in the story frame is hmm. a woman typing. So let me, you know, if we were watching it dramatically or thinking about it dramatically, I just have a person going like this. Far more interesting in this piece are the mm. are the images of you know the woman who like in order to bring her out of the coma the husband slaps her and she gets up and slaps him back and then they start having a slapping fight right so like that's much more dramatically interesting because something so imagine here this is this is the we are mm. we are dramatists so this is the stage mm. what are we going to do Am I going to take my stage and I'm going to put me, okay, imagine me, I'm this yeah. reporter now, and here I am mm. on the stage. Mm -hmm. That's not as interesting as... Yeah. Right? I was, yeah. playing, both parts, I was playing both parts there. I don't know yes. if you could tell that. <laughs> Ab Abhinav was following me, I'm sure. So... Yeah. <laughs> I don't I don't have the cut screen. I'm not able to, you know, do the fancy stuff. But you see, when we have a conflict that actually has two people, that's more dramatically yeah. interesting. As writers, we say, ah, I have more to work with because I have characters. I said earlier yeah. that we're dramatists and what we work with are characters. Human <laughs> beings are miracles, they're miraculous, they're amazing, they do all sorts of wonderful things, right? We love to get them on the stage. That's our primary job. If you're not going to do that, then you're going to be creating a tension between these different kinds of texts. Right. A, conflict, mm -hmm. a conflict created by mm -hmm. different kinds of texts, I'm going to argue is less engaging yeah. than a conflict of human beings, physical human beings. But yeah. that's going back to, if you're going to invite everyone to a cricket match mm -hmm. and you start juggling, you better be a hell of a juggler, right? You better make those, you better, maybe not, maybe you're juggling flaming pins or maybe you're, fl you know, uh, you know, saw blades or maybe you're juggling whatever it is you're juggling. It has to engage us. So, um, so yeah, I mean, what you're saying is, is a possibility and, and I think you should work with it, you know, honestly, yeah. because I think that this is, I think this is a good piece and I think it's a piece that people will be interested in. So I think you should write this. Um, okay. okay. Um, I had, in, um, yeah, go on, please. 
Oh, I was going to say, in some other ways, you know, you might also, you could, you, so you could do this thing where you're trying to join it by having her typing it, right? So that creates a kind of focus. But the other thing you could do is, like I'm saying, you're creating a conflict between different kinds of texts. You could make that more pronounced, right? You could make the fact that these are different texts more pronounced, right? So then you have the voice, like, for example, the first paragraph might be in quotation marks. So we do think of it as a newscaster. The interview might be single spaced or it might be in italics, right? And then something yeah, okay. else might. So now we see that we're really having a, an, we're really dealing with this sort of meta universe. Yeah. But like I say, that is um, not that as is, that's no, no, it's a, it's experimental for us. We have complete freedom. Whatever works, works. We just have to make it work. And what we're working with finally is a human audience that responds to tension, mm -hmm. right? Uh, release, tension, release, tension, release. And then finally yeah. we flip them over on their back. We're always dealing with the same animal. So we just have to figure out what it is that we want to do. You know, um, yeah. we're part of the equation. We have to deal with this pesky audience. The pesky audience is just like us. So we can understand them. And then, but just as important is, what do we want to do? What is mm -hmm. it that we want to, you know, we're giving our lives over to these projects. We give our time and our life to these projects and making them. So mm -hmm. don't don't give that up. If this is if this is where your heart is, you know, do it. And I I like this piece. I can worry that when we create satire out of something that's so important that we make it a joke. So I think you also want to think about that in this piece generally, right? I mean, I think that yeah. uh, the subjugation of women and violence towards women is not something that um, you know we want to we want to be careful about. I think make, making it just like, oh, well, now we don't care about it. I, I noticed this, we, you know, my my daughter loves Marvel movies. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, they, it's funny. And then there's a lot of death everywhere. It's like, it's kind of making a joke out of actual human suffering in its way. And, and I think that as writers, you know, we have a responsibility because we as writers, we again, we go to character. We go yeah. to the human animal as our subject. And, and we clearly care about human beings or else we would not give them this kind of attention. We would give attention to other things, right? But we give our right. attention to human beings. So I think we don't want to diminish their struggle, you know, finally. So I think that's something to put into to the mix, you know, like how yeah. do you make, how do you make your satire really uh cutting you know you know how do you make it really bite um there's a i'm not gonna i think it's jason peel but there's a number of satirists that do really great work um mm -hmm. oh. i like this piece i i uh i didn't understand what rcw meant I thought I thought this was a legit. I actually thought you were writing legit nonfiction <laughs> at at first, and then I caught on later on. Yeah, uh, yeah. I but, think this. You are right. I think this could be the first draft of this, and I should experiment other formats. I considered it. I will try. Try try a couple other formats. I don't think I think there's are going to be some people if you if you get it so that it works. I mean, it's just you're you're giving yourself a complicated mechanism right now. But if you if you can make it so it works and it's also not very long, I think it 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 has a it has some power to it. And I would work on that formatting. You are writing different kinds of format, basically. I mean, that's what you're doing. I mean, writing is a kind of formatted activity anyway. And most of us are writing a narrative format. And so that yeah. allows us more 
flexibility, but you're writing very formatted types of work. You're writing the kind of thing that a newscaster says. You're writing the kinds of ways that people respond in interviews, right? You're using these things, so use them more so, right? Okay. Um, you're involving yourself in this kind of textual experience. You can go that direction. The other direction yeah. you can go is, it would be very hard to write this as a story, but it can be done. I just don't know how to do it. I don't write those kinds of stories, you know, that can go, you know, that can write like zombie apocalypse. I mean, sort of zombie <laughs> apocalypse, um, uh, this uh, contagion, you know, various kinds of stories. I don't know how to write those as short stories. I've never written them. That's not how I focus my time. Um, I'm more familiar with those kinds of things as movies, but if they yeah. exist, and maybe maybe Abhinav or someone else knows of a good one that sort of deals with sort of zombie apocalypse type uh, material, that kind of scope, because that's also the scope that you have here. And I think the more you go towards that scope, the better, yeah. right? Um, yeah. Mm. Yeah, a, a, an interesting piece. And I, I really appreciate you um, putting, putting it out there. And I also want to say that I, I appreciate you know, you're, you're doing this with humor, but I know for myself now at this point, I've, I've always been kind of funny, but the being funny comes out of a way to deal with discomfort and pain, right? So I, I see that, that tension in here, which is the tension of satire, you know? And, and I think it's, um, I hope you'll keep developing that and work with it because you know, we, we're disposed in various ways to deal with life in various ways. And I can see that you have this, this sat satirizing bent. And some of the greatest writers that I love, uh, Jonathan Swift, you know, maybe huh. the highest among, among them, you know, we're satirists. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, follow that. We, we want to, all of us as writers, we want to we want to understand our weaknesses and work on them, right? But we also want to appreciate our strengths and develop our strengths. You know, we can always hide our weaknesses by not doing them, but we need to get something on the page that's also strong. So I, I see that you have this strength and I hope you develop it. Yes, thank you. Um, and so I just have two questions. Uh, yeah. uh, the, my first question was about the title. Um, so my earlier title was, um, it wasn't so conversational, right? So I have this, I, I think I'm quite, I am quite bad at titles, but in general, my I lean towards, um, how do I put it? Um, um, so my earlier title was called Rotten Cores, which is an other, which was a sarcastic <laughs> uh, expansion of RC. Okay. And which gets revealed in the end. You know, whereas I changed it to this, which is a more, which gave, which also I think gave you that contagion zombie ap ap apocalypse feel, which is that a very conversational, but don't let it happen to you because at the end of this story, the reporter who writes it also gets the condition. Right. So, yeah. so to me, so don't let it happen to you was yet another, like to me was another voice that I couldn't really understand within the context. Uh, like, okay. who's telling me that? Like, uh, I could, so this would have been more contextualized for me if you had imitated um, like a newspaper headline, you know, unknown contagion yeah. strikes Indian women, right? Uh -huh. If you wrote unknown contagion strikes Indian women, and then we started having the story, I would understand this in a kind of context, right? Yeah. As a, as a sort of media it's a kind of media production, if yeah. that's what you want to do. But if you want it to be about a character mm. who's writing the story, that's a different way to focus the attention, yeah. right? Sure. Um, so then mm. the title might be, I'm not sure what, you know? Yeah. And if you were going to be, you know, again, you have this meta thing in it because you use different textual things. You know, it could be, you know, um, 
journalist writing about strange contagion that strikes Indian women finds out she has been struck, right? You know, like it's, you know, it's commenting. What happens in metafiction is that it comments upon itself. Um, it's, it creates a kind of self-commentary and that's, um, yeah. I think that's one way to define it. It's a well, it's that post it's a postmodern um, yeah. thing. Mm, sure. Decide my my second focus, question. Experiment Sorry. a couple of ways. Decide on your focus mm -hmm. and write up a couple of them. Maybe write write the sure. script. Yeah. Write a short script. Yeah, I think I should just get it out on paper, whichever way it works. Yeah, um, it, I'm sorry. My good. last question was actually just about the reveal, right? Um, as to what this condition is, what causes it. Actually, my initial draft, I had put it halfway through, but one of, I mean, I had just have a set of friends I sent it to. One of them said he lost interest after he found out about it. So, Papa, don't talk. Sorry, one minute, okay? I'll do it later. Sorry, at least, sorry. <laughs> no worries, I got kids. Yeah, come here, sit, sit next to me, come. Huh. So, so he said he lost interest after I revealed the condition, what caused it. And he told me to move the reveal to the end. Right. So this was another, I mean, another thought I had. Because um, it's like, because it's a very, it has familiar, this story has a lot of familiar factors. Right? It, uh -huh. it, it references coronavirus. It, it talks about Indian women and their lives. So it's, um, it's not entirely alien. Right. Um, so again, it sort of depends on what you're going for. So a story always has to take us from point A through B, something happens, the antagonistic force confronts A and we end up with C. So like I say, like A through B oh, okay. equals C, yeah. which there's some yeah, kind yeah. of change. The way uh, it seems to me, I'm not, I'm not mm. an expert with TV shows and things like that. But this idea of the reveal is a way to be like, ah, oh, there it is, the big change. <laughs> oh, you know, we were doing the work on the bathroom and now here it is. Let's look at it. Oh, we had all this struggle and now we have a beautiful bathroom. Um, that is a way to create a story arc, basically. It yeah. depends what kind of story arc you want to create. The okay. story arc of, you know, renovating your bathroom, to me, and then the reveal of the bathroom is not as important to me. I honestly do not watch those shows. I don't care about someone's bathroom renovation and these other bourgeois concerns, basically. I want to know about the transformation of character. So you have to decide what you want to do. If you're dealing with the journalist, then it's about her awakening and enlightenment. That's the... the mm. The, the traditional reveal of short stories or yeah. you know of literature is basically yeah. epiphanic. It's like it is enlightenment. It's the it is the universal story, yeah. you know, yeah. of character enlightenment, which is something that is very relevant to every human being. I am going to tell you truthfully: the relevance of someone's bathroom renovation to me is mm -hmm. minimal. But that's yeah. just me. There's obviously mm, millions mm. of people that care. So, so yeah. You have yeah, to decide. I understood the show. Sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for this piece and submitting it. Um, Abhinav, I think uh, we have you and Ram, and maybe you want to push to next week, or I'm, I'm happy to. Yeah, like, let's push both to next week. Uh, we are at uh, uh, the 90 minute mark and Ashwini had also sent a piece but he had to drop off. So yeah. we do have three pieces I believe for next week and uh, uh, and hopefully more. So let's, uh, uh, you know, let's cover them uh, when we meet next Sunday. So okay, one great. question actually, this coming week, right? Thursday, Friday is Thanksgiving in the US. Oh, yeah. So Sunday, are you up for it or should I cancel? You know, I think okay. we better cancel that one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Come, the holiday season is a little bit difficult and there's always everyone's scrambling with what, what to do with the kids all the time. So I know that I'll be very busy with that. So I'll cancel the one on the 20 scheduled for the 27th of December and then we will meet on the 4th of December.